Oh, you thought I was going to stop at the modern doctors? Nah. When I said I was a Doctor Who nerd, I meant I was a Doctor Who nerd. We're doing them all. If I could tell myself even three years ago that I would have a strong opinion on the Eighth Doctor, I wouldn't believe you. You have to be a very particular kind of fan to get a lot out of the audiobooks and the comics and the novels, which, apart from one hour of movie and five minutes of TV, that's mostly where this Doctor resides. The TV movie wasn't great. And you'd think, yeah, this Doctor got dealt a bad hand with only one story. But this hiatus also made McGann the longest standing actor to play the role. The definitive Doc Man. Sorry, Doc Woman. And if there was any Doctor who had to be trapped in audio-only stories, I'm glad it was this one. Paul McGann's voice is gorgeous! Sisterhood of Khan. Keepers of the flame of utter boredom. Eternal life. That's the one. I think he is by default the hottest doctor just by that voice. A year ago I made this uh, to help me make these videos, but really Paul McCann doesn't belong in any of them. He definitely is not defined by his romanticism. Okay, maybe like a mystical romanticism follows him, but he's just as much scientific, level-headed, and often quite cold. Don't be fooled by the mellow voice, the Eighth Doctor will take you to some places you didn't know the Doctor could go. So when I say romanticism follows him, that's not a David Tennant kiss all your companions kind of romanticism. Take this moment. Wow, I wonder where we'll end up next. Look John, I think Grandfather's catching up on his own dreams. And Doctor Who's dream lasts a long time. But when he wakes up he finds he's all alone. He's sorry to leave his grandchildren. He visits them as often as he can, but he can never stay long. He likes their world very much. Villains are naughty, not evil. People never die and promises are never broken. It's a place where all the endings are happy ones. His world and their world may never become one. But he'll keep trying to make it happen. I don't know. He's a hard one to pin down, because he's been so many different things and been around for so long, he kind of has become everything the Doctor can be. In summary, I'd describe him as nostalgic, poetic, inquiring, and slightly vengeful. Yes, they really did miss a beat when they didn't bring him back for the 2005 reboot. But it's not too late, BBC. Whilst Doctor Who takes a break getting ready for Whittaker, would have been the perfect time for some TV McGann stories. Do it whilst he's still young. Do it whilst he's still pretty. And he is pretty. He's a pretty fantasy doctor. It's kind of interesting how he bridges the gap and paves the way for what we'd get later with the more romantic modern doctors. And oh, the romance stuff in Zagreus is even more lovey-dovey melodramatic than fucking Rose. So... Okay. Most conventionally attractive Doctor ranking. Let's go. One, two, three, four? Ah, uh, five. Definitely. Well, glad that's settled. With so much Ape Doctor material out there, I've been on a marathon reading, watching, listening to every single bit of eight media I could. Whilst, of course, there's still so much I have not seen, I feel pretty confident giving my opinion. Let's start off with the five worst stories. Doctor Who and the Seasons of Fear If you ever wanted to make the cliché Doctor Who theatrical movie, this is how you'd go about it. The pitch? A mysterious man called Sebastian Grail meets the Doctor at a New Year's party and tells him, In the future I have killed you, Doctor! So, naturally quite alarmed by this, the Doctor and Charlie track Grail across all of history, where they will find little Grails all through the vortex. Different versions of him through time and space. Think Blackadder, but also a pantomime villain. That is a killer premise, and I still can't really tell you where this episode drops the ball. It's fast paced, it's fun and exciting, but it also feels tacky like a science fiction 60s serial. And I know that's funny to say about Doctor Who, but I mean this in the worst possible way. This story is a trek, like say, The Chase or The Infinite Quest, and just like The Infinite Quest, this episode is a cartoon. Convoluted nonsense, sci-fi nonsense, melodramatic nonsense. The Nimmin are in it, sorry, spoiler, the fucking Nimmin are in it. So yeah, big big up to the 
Nimmin fan base, but uh, personally, I'm not thrilled. Number two, the Time War. Yeah, just this year, Big Finish threw Paul McGann into the Time War. This is like a childhood dream come true. Part of me wishes I could hold this and just gift it to my 11 year old self, and he would be ecstatic over the fucking moon. So, delivering on wish fulfillment, did they succeed? For the most part, yes. This is a brilliant box set. I recommend it to basically everyone, even if you haven't listened to any Big Finish before. This is a great jumping on point for the audio dramas. The first story starts off like a cliché Doctor Who adventure, only to get turned on its head. The second one involves the Doctor and a bunch of refugees convincing a damaged Dalek that they are its friend. And oh, you've never heard one Dalek be this cute and also terrifying at the same time. And then story three. Every box set has to have its dud. Every series has its bad episodes. What the fuck did they do to the Time War? The conscript was written by Matt Fitton. Again, a very nice premise. The Doctor is taken into a Time Lord internment camp and trained, forced to fight in the Time War. Now that sounds like a gold mine. We get to see just how twisted the Time Lords got, and we're throwing an old Doctor into new Who territory. How'd you mess this up? Well, apparently it's by making the Gallifreyan army fucking embarrassing. When you think of the high-concept sci-fi society of the Time Lords, I don't think this. Keep up the pace! Right to the top! This was their army? This is cliche for Dad's army. The Time Lords are meant to be grandiose, above anything we can conceive, and in my mind they do not sing 1940s barrack songs. I think the single worst thing a sci-fi universe like this can do is make the universe smaller. When the Doctor Who world becomes more simple, you take some of that gravitas away. And suddenly, yes, I'm on that fence, debating whether we should even be making Time War dramas in the first place, considering it was meant to be the stuff of mystery. But, as the rest of this box set proves, it's fine if you just get good writers to do good stories. That said though, it's still a good box set, pick it up. In 2008, The Eighth Doctor got a BBC radio run, with a new companion and shorter storylines that made them more modern. I hate them. I know Lucy Miller is a companion with a lot of fans, but I just can't get into any of these stories. And I think the most bland and forgettable is Phobos. And I put Phobos on here because I literally don't remember what happens. There's a monster voice in a cave on a ski lodge and uh, it sends out monsters before being beaten by a speech. Does that sound like a classic? I'm sorry Phobos, there's nothing offensive in this story, it's just it's so forgettable, all of these covers are just interchangeable to me. And honestly, I'd take a bad episode over a boring episode any day. Also, fun fact, if you live in the UK, go on Spotify, they have so many free audiobooks, including some of the best stories this company has ever put out. DAYS of entertainment for free. <sighs> I don't like Dark Eyes either. Okay, the majority of Dark Eyes. There are, I, there's some of Dark Eyes I do not like. Four big expensive box sets of high concept space opera techno babble. For the record, there are individual episodes which are fantastic. The Death of Hope, The Great War, and probably the best of this set, Master of the Daleks. Killer. Great stories. But the quality and storylines are just not consistent. I mean, it's not all bad as some of McGann's best performances and the best master I've seen in ages. You, Julius, are a naughty bastard. Best thing I've read all year. It's the only thing, man. You've done some pretty awful things to me in my time, but this takes the bloody biscuit. You bumder! <sighs> I, I just can't unsee that. But none of that will redeem X and the Daleks. You know when Mothat used to like build up an ending for months and months and then when it came to the finale it was some technobabble and then it was finished. Completely unsatisfying, basically magic. 
Well, let's just say the audiobooks aren't always above that themselves. I think it's just added insult to injury because these box sets do cost so much money. They are a big investment and I just wish I could have bought these stories individually. This might even be my least favourite run if it wasn't for Molly and the Tardy Box. Ah, ah. Let's play a drinking game for every time we hear the word retrogenitor particles. Cause that sounds fun. And finally, let's talk about that goddamn TV movie. Released in 1996, the TV movie was actually planned to be part of a reinvention and Americanization of Doctor Who, which could have also resulted in a new American TV series. And going by this, I am so glad it flopped. Americans didn't care about Doctor Who yet. It's just a very confused production, and this story does have its fans. But if this was a TV pilot, it wouldn't give me enough to go on to make me say, I want to watch more of that! Especially when you've got the master camping it up. The seventh doctor shot in an alley- what the fuck? No. And way too many references to the previous series, to the point where it would alienate any new viewers. So basically, who was this for? Is everything bad? No, not at all. Whoever cast Paul McGann is a goddamn genius. I love the idea of a doctor being half human, even though nobody else does, and that was immediately dropped. And it's just different. I think you have to admire something that tries to be so strikingly its own thing. It just failed, and didn't get off the ground. Oh well, probably for the best. On to the good ones! Whatever part of me thought I loved you, that urge, it is dead to me now as my sight. I've definitely talked about Skirtso before, because it's one of the most important episodes ever created. Walking through a white abyss, the Doctor and Charlie start becoming one. The TARDIS is gone, the Doctor is scared, and an abstract creature of sound is toying with them. It doesn't get much better than this, the Doctor's relationship not only with Charlie, but with every single companion he's ever had is put to the test here. Why does he take companions? Why does he involve himself with humans? The answer is a lot darker than you may assume. It's also a story with jump scares. I hate jump scares, but this story earns them. It's a surrealist nightmare. And if you could only listen to one audio story, I only gave it one shot, make it this one. On a similar note, The Chimes of Midnight is a very similar story. Caught in a horror maze, the Doctor and Charlie must confront one of their own children that they've created through the paradox. This is one of those mystery stories where you're hanging on every single detail. The story has so much fun unravelling itself to you that you're just like trying to figure it out constantly. I don't want to give away any spoilers, but let's pitch it by saying the Doctor and Charlie play a real life game of Cluedo. Ah, oh, but it's so much more than that. It's also a Christmas episode with suicide and murders. It's four episodes of fun Victorian asphyxiation and plum pudding. But then again, Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without Mrs. Badley's plum puddings. Also, it's actually scary, which is more than you can say for a lot of audio-based dramas. Number three, The Flood. Fun fact, this was actually meant to be Paul McGann's final outing as the Doctor, with him regenerating into Eccleston at the very end. Russell T Davies said, screw that, and then did nothing with it, but this is still a phenomenal story. This is the best Cyberman story of all time. Now, not everybody knows how to best use the Cybermen. Sometimes they are body horror zombies, other times they are space Nazis. But in the Flood, these are Cybermen from the far future. Intelligent, elegant, even slightly charismatic, which they totally shouldn't be, but it works. 21st century England doesn't stand a chance, because these Cybermen are not messing around. They have time travel capabilities. Now, this was actually published in the issues of Doctor Who magazine, so I imagine it's very hard to find now, but they did actually publish it, so if you can find it, read it. And then my other favourite Cyberman story, The Silver Turk. This episode did Mondazian Cybermen scary before Doctor Who did Mondazian Cyberman scary. I am in pain, kill me. In the middle of a Victorian expo, a great showman has created a mechanical marvel. A metal man who can play the piano and beat you at chess. Obviously, it's a bit more than a sideshow. Now, this premise actually seems quite lacking. And it is a small scale story, 
but it's so intensely creepy and the atmosphere is dripping. Is it sound design? Is it the humanization of Cybermen? I mean, it definitely helps that the body horror for Cybermen lends itself to audio. God, all my favorite eight stories are just so deliciously dark. It's also the first outing for new companion, Mary Shelley. Yeah, the, the author of science fiction. Obvious Frankenstein parallels here, but beyond them, it's just a great time and a really immersive story. Sometimes you come across them, three hour epics that do all the work for you, and it's never a chore to keep up with. And finally, oh, terra firma. The Doctor and friends have just escaped a series long arc called The Divergent, finally re-emerging into their own universe to find it conquered by Daleks. Ha, <laughs> these guys again, that's original. And yet, the story actually acknowledges this. It is, please, Doctor, don't touch anything. Oh, I wouldn't dream of it, Your Grace. It is Grace, by the way, or Highness. How does one address an Emperor? Politely. <laughs> yes, of course. You almost feel bad for them, as if they're underdogs in the first 10 minutes of the story? But trust me, there was no need to when you find out what them and Davros have done to the world. Holy shit. Apart from the obvious time war, this is probably the most evil, deranged, and big scale thing the Daleks have ever achieved. And not only is it apocalyptic end of world, but it's personal. All of it was a vendetta against the Doctor who blew up their home planet. Actions have consequences. I really don't know how much of it to give away because it's such a good story that I want you to find out yourself. But the Doctor Davros interactions are unparalleled. God, I want to put this in and listen to it right now just to hear Davros and the Doctor's witty banter and to see the Doctor's world destroyed. And I'm gonna be a coy boy. I'm not gonna say any more. Those are five stories you absolutely have to seek out. And really any of them, because the Eighth Doctor is a Doctor who deserves a lot more love. Nobody got to really grow up with the Eighth Doctor like, say, Tennant or Tom Baker. But he actually offers a lot and brings so much more to the role. Yeah, his actual acting can vary depending on how much he's actually interested in the story itself. But if you ever get to a point in your life where you feel like you've run out of Doctor Who, Trust me, you haven't. There's a whole treasure box waiting just over there. And loads of it's free. Thanks for watching.